Bob been at Camping Houston in 1971 and has been involved with the city ever since. He graduated from the University of Houston Law Center in 1974 and accepted a job with the federal government in Washington, D.C. The nation's capital was a homecoming since Bennett had earned his B.A. and his B.A. and M.A. at George Washington University while he was working as a legislative aide for the United States Congressman Patrick Caffrey. In 1976, he moved back to Houston and served three years as an assistant United States attorney for the Western District of Texas. For nearly 40 years, Bennett has been involved in bar activities by lecturing at CLEs all over the state, serving the HBA committees, and he was the former president of the University of Law Center Alumni Association. Everybody, welcome Mr. Bennett. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, as I said, that we're going after uh, quality tonight, not quantity, and I appreciate everybody showing up. And before I really get going, I'm just curious if anybody knows what TLAP is, Texas Lawyers Assistance Program. Is it something that you have heard about? A uh, show of hands, there's one back there, a nod, two yeah. people. Okay, what do you know about that? Because this, I think, is going to be more of a dialogue than a speech, and I want to just talk about it. I'm on the uh, State Bar of Texas TLAP committee and I've been on it for two years and I have one more year to go on my term. So uh, I, I'm just curious as to where we are as to the extent of knowledge you have about it. Drug program. Drug program, right. Uh, is, is that what it's kind of known as? Does anybody else know anything about it? Substance abuse. Substance abuse, drug program. Uh, do you know that TLAP also covers paralegals and legal secretaries and professional legal staffs? Yes. And uh, they do everything, kind of summarize real quickly, and then we'll get into the speech. But I want you to know this as you uh, go away from this uh, talk this evening, that they cover everything from having a 24-hour uh, hotline that you can call, 800 number, 24 hours, and uh, someone, usually an attorney, will answer that phone to actually paying for uh, drugs and hospital visits and in some place residential stays. Uh, so it has to be an application, has to be filled out uh, for the higher end things. But if you or paralegal or legal assistant or legal clerk, or obviously attorney, judge, has any issue, uh, mental health, uh, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, um, even in some cases financial difficulties, TLAP is the organization within the Texas Bar that will address those issues and there's always somebody to talk to or help. Uh, so with that, let me get into what we have here tonight. And this uh, was original presentation by Chris Ritter. And Chris is the executive director of the um, TLAP program and has been for several years. He's a lawyer and also a, uh, has a master's in education. And uh, Chris is very... Uh, competent and qualified and experienced at many levels. He's a recovering alcoholic and uh, uh, knows how to address any issue that somebody comes up with. I've used him for my clients, I've used him for other issues, and I just want to start off by saying if you ever want to know more about TLAP, you can call him up and he's happy to uh, answer questions and talk to you about it. Okay, with that, let's kind of get going. Uh, the major problems for professionals, and this is in your little handout so you can follow along with me, stress, anxiety, depression, burnout, secondary trauma. Uh, whether it's a situation where somebody's doing criminal law and has to handle uh, murder cases, or even the anxiety of putting together contracts and uh, international law, which I kind of switched topics on you, there's stress, anxiety, difficulty, and you know that as well as anybody, and how it not only affects you, but also affects the lawyers working with you. Uh, alcohol, substance abuse, cognitive impairment, that you have mental issues, you can't really uh, think correctly, suicide, gambling, and other process addictions. So these are just uh, the big issue with a lot of people say, well, uh, dentists and doctors have as many problems. Well, the truth is, uh, and we'll see these statistics, that uh, attorneys have a greater incident of these problems uh, than any other profession. And part of that is, as you know, the uh, conflict, uh, the uh, uh, two people coming together, uh, usually in a surgery, you don't have the doctors and nurses uh, competing against each other. Even in a transaction where you're trying to put a deal together, you have both sides. 
And so that type of conflict that is uh, natural to the practice of law starts in law school and carries on through the practice. Related problems of stress. Uh, law students uh, have a, a, a higher uh, degree of stress problems than medical students or graduate students. Uh, and, I, and I think I said, and I, you know, there may be a situation that you know uh, with a law student, and, and the uh, TLAP program also covers law students. And given the small nature of this group, uh, and the attractiveness of this group, and I looked intelligent of this group, I would really like to have at any point that if you have questions for me, feel free to jump in and ask those questions. And uh, if there's some concern, uh, you can say, well, I heard that, or some attorney down the hall said, and I'm happy to try to answer those questions as we go along. So this is an interesting statistic that shows that law students uh, have the highest degree of stress problems of any uh, graduate program. This is the 2015 ABA study of almost 13,000 attorneys and attorney mental health issues. 46% have been depressed, 28% suffer from clinic depression, 61% suffering from anxiety, 19% have anxiety disorder, and 11.5% considered suicide. In the last two years, I've had four close friends uh, commit suicide who were lawyers or uh, in, a, in a, a clerk or, or a paralegal position. And we see that rising among uh, lawyers today. In fact, Young, rising. Young, is there an age? Um, with the people that I know, uh, all of them were probably older as opposed to younger. But I think we had a suicide at uh, Andrews Kurth uh, last year of a young uh, associate there. Wow. So it really doesn't, doesn't uh, address a uh, age. Uh, the, one of the really tragic things is there's a higher incidence of suicide among children than it's ever been before. And so that's just the nature. Uh, you know, some people blame it on the social media and how we are, you know, everyone's on their phone, a lot of things about that. Uh, and I guess we really didn't need to have a virus attack us right now, but that's the reality of it. So, uh, and, and these are reported, okay? So, and you can think about how many attorneys want to go ahead and report something like this. So they're probably higher than this. Uh, depression, according to 1991 John Hopkins University study of depression in 105 professions, lawyers ranked number one in the incident of depression. And uh, uh, part of that is again meeting deadlines, part of that is just the nature of the business, part of that is always having to get something done. And you know, speaking to this group, you are the ones that really have a hands-on um, ability to know what's going on in a law office more maybe than some of the attorneys. And I will say that uh, TLAP also does, in the right circumstance, in the right of protocol, does intervention and also they accept confidential calls. So you see some attorney that's depressed or coming in late or can't get the work out or hides a bottle in the cabinet and all these things happen and no matter where you are, rural, city, uh, large law firms, small law firms, those things happen. The ABA study of 4,000 law students 43% believe they need a mental health profession. 26% uh, have an eating disorder. Um, when I was in law school at the University of Houston, starting many years ago, 1971, uh, but I've kept up with the law school, as president of the Law School Association, and, and have lectured out there, been out there quite a bit, getting ready to build a new law school building, so I kind of keep up with that uh, arena. And uh, during probably the first 20 years that I was either there or associated with it, I never heard of anybody talking about or really addressing the mental health, the wellness of law students. Now that has changed in most law schools, and most law schools now have a program that address this. Uh, recently at Texas Tech in Lubbock, they have sort of a quiet room that you can go to and just relax, which is all we, uh, just never heard of before uh, in the law school arena because you had to be tough, you had to be hard drinking, you had to be competitive, right. you had, et cetera, et cetera. And that carried on uh, to the interview and to which firm you went with. So I think that's changing, which is a good thing. Uh, percentage suffering from depression before, during, after law school. You can see those figures there. That's in your handout. Uh, and, and 2015, uh, the problem of drinking, the general population, 25% greater, all attorneys uh, the green 21% attorneys under the age of 30 is actually higher. 
So that continues to be a problem within the legal profession. And, uh, you know, even a paralegal, a legal secretary is known to have a drink from time to time and suffer problems. Uh, how drinking affects law students. It shows the increase first year, second year, and third year. Uh, lawyers versus doctors. This is always an interesting uh, presentation about uh, attorneys have 2.4 times the rate of drinking problems as doctors. And again, I think that's the adversarial nature of the practice. Whether you're drawing up a contract, whether you're going to court, uh, whether you're just giving advice, it's still the adversarial nature of the practice of law. Uh, time for a, a, a stiff drink. Uh, this shows uh, how, as you get older, how many more uh, uh, consumption of drinks a person has. Um, concurring mental disorders, percentage with concurring mental disorders, and this would be stress, depression, etc. Again, attorneys uh, rank higher. I'm not telling you anything that uh, you don't know, but it's interesting to see the actual statistics that you have there in your handout. Now, the stress continuum is an issue of what, how this gets to the point where somebody becomes clinically, clinically depressed or somebody gets to the point where they're suicidal. And there is a, a stress, chronic stress, that happens all the time, burnout. Uh, in a Wisconsin study, direct exposure to clients' hardship causes harm. At risk of depression, 40% of lawyers, 20% of staff, compassion fatigue, burnout. And compassion fatigue is you wanting to do the best for your attorney, you wanting to do the best for your client, you wanting to be sure that deadline's meet, met, and you're working weekends, you're working after five, you're working, uh, you know, get ready for a trial, you're working to try to get out the uh, documents that you need, and all of this is uh, part of the difficulty with the law practice. TLAP, now I'm going to go into a little bit of what TLAP provides, and then we can talk about some specific examples. Everything that TLAP does, I need to stress this, is uh, confidential. So uh, it's by statute. Uh, you can call up and you don't have to uh, provide your uh, name or information. Uh, you don't have to uh, say uh, specifically. You just can say that you would like for somebody to uh, call uh, the lawyer or call the person. We do have referrals to licensed professionals with experience or expertise near you. We keep a volunteer list of, uh, we have some paralegals and legal secretaries, but also lawyers that are going through uh, some type of recovery process or recovery group. Uh, they can make references, referrals to these groups. Uh, there's uh, articles to be read. There's video on the TLAP site. So all of these are available to the person who has issues or questions or concerns. We provide one-to-one -one local peer support. I've had a situation where the Board of Law Examiners had a problem with one of the law students, and we had this person hook up with a, another lawyer who had a similar problem, and they've become close friends and kind of steered this person through the uh, exam process and through getting this person licensed. So that's available. Uh, CLE and Education on Wellness and Service Opportunities. That is kind of a summary of what TLAP provides. Evidence-based prevention of and solutions for, to anxiety and other issues. Let me go through this kind of quickly here. Uh, one, debriefing is telling someone about what has happened or going over an experience or set of actions to achieve uh, some sort of order or meaning concerning them. Uh, these are some, just some basic things that you may not have thought about in a situation. And I'm not saying that anybody here has any of these situations or any of these concerns. But as somebody within the uh, legal profession, or even retired from the legal profession, you know these things occur. And we've, I'm, I'm giving terms to them so that you understand that there is a process here of trying to address the problems that paralegals, legal secretaries, uh, lawyers, judges have. Learn to relax. Uh, besides the debriefing, parasympathetic or disorder. I had to get that one right. Parasympathetic nerves, nervous system is the way that we are uh, geared down and are able to uh, relieve ourselves of stress. And whether it's through mediation, uh, me mediation, meditation, whether it's through praying, whether it's through running, whether it's through jogging, whether it's doing yoga. Uh, I used to swim a lot and that was, and I need to get back to it, but I swam for about 15 years and that was one of the most relaxing uh, activities that I had. This is a little technical 
about these two systems that we have, the sympathetic system where in the uh, parasympathetic system, which causes uh, a reaction or there is a reaction to the stress and what happens with our bodies when these situations occur. With the sympathetic system, we have heart and blood pressure increase, respiratory accelerates, blood sugar is released from the liver, adrenaline, uh, noradrenaline are released from the adrenal glands, and we have this symptom of fight or flight. And the parasympathetic system, our heartbeat slows, blood pressure reduces, respiratory levels even out, your body experiences visceral responses, typical of periods of rest and relaxation, rest and digest. And the question is, how do we get that with all the stress and frustration and difficulty that we have in the practice of law? Uh, mindfulness and breathing exercises. Now this is some really interesting things that we have scientifically proven that if you simply do some breathing exercises, uh, go to the restroom, go down the hall, try to get away from that situation, and do these, you can see the uh, uh, how it decreases high anxiety and uh, moderate anxiety by doing simply breathing exercises, okay? Uh, and that is, well, just do it. Just close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. You see how much slower my speech is? And actually you feel a little sense of peace and relaxation. A simple exercise like that could be a wonder. These are some other ways that we need to learn how to relax. And especially in the high tension jobs that you have in the law practice. Running, hiking, walking, swimming, dancing, playing a musical instrument, yoga, painting, creative art, gardening, working with hands, golfing, and cooking. And so I'm just curious in this group right here, is there anybody that would like to share a one of those that they do and how that really affects you, what you, uh, uh, or something else that you feel helps you that might be of interest to the other participants or other... Uh, I have to just expand on the breathing exercises. Okay. Um, that I have actually recently found that that helps me a lot. And it's not breath from up here. It's when you breathe in through your abdomen very deeply. The diaphragm. Yes. And um, I do that um, just five deep breaths um, a few times a day. And it just takes a minute or two. And it really does help. Thank you for sharing that. Would, but scientifically, yeah, it's supposed to release hormones. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It helps. Any other examples that uh, somebody would like to share of how they... Uh, I'm sorry? Working out, doing leg cardio. During cardio. Do you go to a gym on a regular basis or where do you work out? There's Everywhere. There's a gym in our building that's free for the tenants. There you go. See, what a good place. And you, tr you try to go there on a regular basis? And you, okay. Every day. Well, it, it shows. It looks good. Okay, <laughs> it does. Well, thank you for sharing that. Here is the other thing that we need to think about, especially in the uh, tension and the difficulty that the law practice has of setting boundaries. And it needs to be a, uh, a sympathetic situation with you and your attorney or you and the other paralegals or secretaries or however it is you, you're doing it so that you don't every weekend have to work or you, every night you have to stay till seven. There needs to be a certain boundaries that only you can stay set, set and stay with those so that you will be able to be the most useful person you can be in work. Uh, I think this connecting with others, uh, I was reading somewhere uh, about longevity and it wasn't whether you took vitamins, it wasn't really uh, whether you drank or didn't drink, you can't, you know, obviously drink heavy or smoke heavy, but it was with connection with others, your ability to connect with others, and whether you had a support system. And those people uh, scientifically have a longer lifespan and are much healthier than those that don't. Uh, and you don't have to be as, uh, I guess, friendly and gregarious as I am, but you do need to have some support system that you can rely on. And I think whatever age and whatever you're doing, that's a good thing to consider. Whether it's uh, 
uh, church or community organizations or organizations like this. Uh, obviously, you get to come place like this and see uh, the nice. De Who did the decorations? <laughs> you did a very good job. Thank you for doing that. It's very pretty. We'll give you a hand for that. I think we should. And I lost. Okay, so moving on. Use my hands. That's what Palm. Well, that's that's good. I can tell. Disconnect from devices. I mean, you know, uh, this right here. I can't tell you how upsetting it is to me when I and at some uh, lunch or dinner and everybody on the table has this and has not turned it off and you don't connect and you've seen the ads with you know families everyone in the family has their phone and so you need to know how to disconnect from that phone and get away from it practice positive thinking gratitude now this is kind of simplistic but at the same time <clears throat> I think the most uh, uh, people who can look at their lives and feel gratitude for either family relationships, the job they have, uh, the fact that they're alive in the United States, the fact that they don't have uh, uh, coron uh, coronavirus, the fact maybe the fact that uh, they uh, have a career they can look back on or involved in. All these things make up a sense of gratitude. And those that have it uh, have um, a more positive outlook. Gratitude practice. One of the things that um, has been recommended, and this sounds again really simplistic, but at the same time it's really helpful to get you thinking about what, how you've been either blessed, how you've been uh, uh, treated right, what is going good in your life, is to keep a uh, gratitude journal uh, versus winning the lottery. And this is a scale that shows, uh, yes, when you win the lottery at time, but soon after that. But with the gratitude journal, it actually increases over time. So that's kind of an interesting comparison, isn't it? Uh, be kind. Uh, when I first started practicing law, uh, I had the attitude that I was supposed to be aggressive, uh, sort of mean, uh, you know, stand up, uh, you know, be the soldier, et cetera, et cetera. And you learn over time that you can accomplish a lot more by simply kindness and understanding what the other person is doing, understanding what the other side is doing. Uh, when I was a federal prosecutor, my standard practice was, uh, we're going to indict your client, but if you want to come in and see the evidence, you want to see what the file looks like, uh, here it is. I'm not trying to hide anything from you. If we take it to trial, we're going to convict him, so we'll try to work out something. When I've done civil practice, and one of the things that I've seen over the years is the use of mediation, and when I started practicing law, we really didn't do it that much, and now it seems like every other attorney is a mediator, but which is fine because I think whether we can resolve conflict prior to going in front of a jury, dragging people to the courthouse, uh, I just saw that in Brazoria they've canceled all jury trials, so we may not be having trials for a while. Probably we'll get that way in Harris County. So the kindness, there's room for kindness even in the practice of law, even among attorneys. Benefits of kindness supported by research. Deactivates the fight or flight nervous system. We talked about that earlier. Helps people deal with negative life events. Reduces the negative effects of difficulties stemming from traumatic events. Helps substantially with motivation. Improves interpersonal relationships. Significantly lowers anxiety. Improves coping abilities. Prevents depression. Um, I'm just curious with this group and the people you've worked with, the attorneys you worked with. Uh, do you have an example of somebody that was really, you don't have to say names, but you can say, you know, attorney A as opposed to attorney B was really tough, mean, etc. But everybody liked attorney B who tried to work with people, tried to get things done, and was actually more productive. Is that, is that a fair comparison? Anybody want to comment on that? <laughs> no? <laughs> you only worked with the, the mean ones, okay. <laughs> but that, that is helpful to know that uh, those are the benefits of uh, being kind. Uh, the other thing that we have trouble with, uh, and, and especially you learn in law school that you have to, you know, go it on your own, you have to do it by yourself, you have to, uh, you know, score the highest point, you have to be competitive, is that you learn not to ask for help. You can't go into a uh, situation and say, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't understand this. And so this type of uh, fight or flight syndrome uh, gets embedded certainly in the law profession, certainly among the attorneys you know, and the ability to ask for help where a person really may need someone to call for them or need to call TLAP for them. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go along. 
uh, expand your spirituality or consciousness. Um, and this can be either uh, from the standpoint of uh, going to church or going to mass or going to the temple or whatever you do to understanding kind of your place in the world and how uh, you fit in and feel that you do have a place here and anything in between. So this spiritual aspect or conscious aspect is very important to somebody who uh, has a wellness attitude and is more successful. Uh, this right here, the last thing here is helping others. Um, I like to come talk to groups. I like to talk to people, hear what they have to say. I like to uh, let them know, especially uh, with what TLAP does, because I think that lawyers as a whole uh, never reach out, never ask for help. And this is one way of getting this information. You may have an attorney in your office or a paralegal in office. You just need to slip one of those cards in on their desk to make sure that they know what's going on or make sure that they know that that type of help is available. And I think that's important. Uh, in 30,000... confidential? I'm sorry? It's strictly confidential? Uh, it is confidential uh, by statute. So there are two parts of that. One, you don't have to call up and give your name uh, or give uh, the other person's name, uh, you know, if you want uh, obviously more specific help, uh, you can say that in this office we have this situation. And the people at TLEP are trained with that and they'll try to work with you. Obviously, if you say uh, John Smith has a problem uh, and if somebody could call him, uh, I don't want to tell my name, right. they, will, they, will be, uh, they will take that confidential call maybe do a little bit more investigation, make sure you're just not trying to get somebody in trouble, maybe, et cetera, et cetera. But it is by statute confidential. So that's not uh, something that uh, they can give out. And they won't give it out. I mean, they really are. I, I've been in that office, and I know how they operate. And they're trying to build up trust with attorneys, judges, separate number for judges. And so I think you can rest assured that that won't uh, uh, become public. People believed that they had a very stressful year and stress was harmful to their health, had a 43% higher risk of death than those who did not. A related study showed that the effect of stress on death rate was completely offset where people were regularly helping others. And so, I mean, you know, do unto others you haven't do unto you. I mean, that's kind of a basic thing, but sometimes we all overlook those basic points. Uh, Texas Lawyers Assistance Program, uh, whoever printed those out, thank you. You have that number there. Uh, if you want my number, I'm happy to give that. Uh, and so that is really the presentation. And I didn't know exactly how much time we needed. And I didn't know how many people would have questions. But with that, with those handouts, with the things I gave, are there any questions or are there any observations or examples you'd like to talk about? Yes, ma'am. What type of action do you I'm take? sorry? What type of action do you take when people call in to you? Well, there's, there's uh, depends on the call. Obviously, uh, if they're, they, we go from, uh, if somebody calls in and I uh, talk a little bit about uh, suicide prevention and suicide situation. If it's a situation where you know that uh, somebody is on the verge of suicide or somebody has said, I'm going to go buy a gun, mm -hmm. uh, something like that, that's one uh, situation where they would probably call the police to go to that person's house if that was necessary. I'm talking about the extremes. Uh, on the other hand, it may be that uh, a person has uh, a need for uh, anti-anxiety medicine. They don't have enough money for it. Uh, TLAP can do that. Uh, they, we can put you with groups. We can put you with counselors. We can put you on one and one uh, You know, we, we have a real active um, AA program. It's another group called Lawyers Concerned with Lawyers. And so all those, if you go on the website, you'll see all that under TLAP. And again, it's all confidential. Uh, and they really do a good job. It's one of the most impressive. I've been with the bar now 40 plus years in different positions. And it really is one of the best programs. It saves lives. That's what uh, I think is very important. Yes, ma'am. Did I miss when this program started? Uh, it actually started in the uh, late 70s and then finally got funded. And, and uh, we're now fully funded. And so, yeah, when I was in law school there, I never heard about it. And so it's been, uh, and, and w almost every Texas Bar Journal has an ad about TLAP in it. But at the same time, there's over 100,000 attorneys and probably even more paralegals and legal secretaries. And we're still trying to get the word out and do things like this so that you on the front line know about it 
and you will be able to either recognize the situation or talk to somebody about it. And again, it's not for lawyers. It's for lawyers, law students, judges, and all legal professionals uh, like yourselves. So I want to be sure that's understood. Yes, ma'am. I just have a question. It's just recently, in this, two months ago, we do oil and gas, and one of the, our operator's wives committed suicide. Is there any words that you can say to those people, I mean, other than I'm so sorry to hear about this? Or well, you? obviously, depending on the relationship, uh, and I think in most of those situations, uh, somebody would appreciate a card. You could send a card to them, as yeah. opposed to just calling them or sending them an email. I still believe in sending cards from time to time, yeah. and that's nice. Uh, and uh, beyond that, it just kind of depends on your closeness to them. Take somebody out to lunch, call them up on the phone, just want to check on you to see how you're doing. So uh, just a little uh, courtesy. I will comment that the funeral home that was handling this was in Fredericksburg, and they had something I'd never seen before, and I've gone to a lot of deaths, funerals. And they said you could send a card from the people home, and they and you just pay six dollars and a half, and you do the card, and they'll send it directly to the family. And that's the first I've seen that in anything. Sounds like sending flowers. Yes. Yeah. As a well, why don't you just send a card directly to the family as opposed if you to the didn't funeral? Know their, their oh, if you didn't know the address, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, that's, that'd be kind of nice, yeah, I suppose. I've never had seen that before. Yeah, so. that was kind of nice. It also seems like a lot of murder or suicides have really come into play. Oh, you know, we're seeing that on the news a lot lately. That's, that's that horrible situation. Disturbing. They're, yeah, they're more open about it now than mm -hmm. yeah. it used to be. As far as you know, it was it was kept secret when somebody committed suicide mm -hmm. in the good old days. I mean, that was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It was something to be ashamed of. That bankruptcy, you know, nothing worse could happen to you. Well, I think we are more open about it, and I think that's good that uh, you also know about what resources there are, and if a situation obviously arises, uh, and you know, there's all levels of response in a suicidal situation. I mean, it's, and I guess the uh, one thing I want to leave with you: there's nothing wrong with you asking somebody if you think it's the situation are you thinking about suicide a lot of the uh, thought is that if you suggest that they're going to do it well by the time they get to that point they actually appreciate and there's statistics that show that can help a person to, for you to simply ask you know are you so depressed that you're thinking about killing yourself are you in such a situation that we could help you can you tell me what's going on with you and we all know uh, of situations that has that has occurred and you know in one of these situations uh, I had a young attorney who actually had come to me I do a lot of licensing work so what that means is doctors lawyers and judges who are usually into sex drugs rock and roll or all three have problems with their license uh, they're in front of the uh, t uh, Texas Medical Board before the Commission for Lawyer Discipline for the Board of Law Examiners and uh, I represent them when they're either trying to get a license or they have a problem with their license. So this young uh, guy came to me, he had a problem. We got him licensed, we got him licensed in Texas, licensed in Oklahoma. He worked for me for a while, then he moved to College Station. We kind of kept up with each other from time to time. I was over there in College Station, we had a case, we talked for a minute. Uh, I went back to Houston and uh, that Sunday he went in the backyard and shot himself. And, I, and I, I look back on that, and that's one of the reasons that I'm so involved in TLAP. I, if there had been any type of sign, I knew that he had gone through depression. I knew that he had gone to group. I knew that he had been seeing a counselor. And I thought that things, there wasn't any sign to me, and maybe I wasn't as sensitive as I should have been. But uh, then I had another attorney, two attorneys. One drugged himself to death, and another drank himself to death. And uh, it just, you know, has made me real c much more sensitive and conscious about what uh, we should be aware of, and also uh, what resources we have. I mean, there are some very good resources. Basically, in suicide, it, it, if you get involved with it, it has a higher success rate than almost any other mental illness, if you catch it at the right time. Yes, ma'am. What's HR's responsibility in a large law firm if they're an amazing attorney and they're a big biller and a rainmaker, but they're an alcoholic, they're a fun functioning alcoholic, they're able to do their job, but they're very difficult to work with. I mean. 
Well, um, that's a difficult situation. I mean, that technically, if you have an HR department, they should be involved. But at the same time, uh, there may be, uh, if you know one of the attorneys who knows that person, you could go to them and say, you know, I can't work for, for Jack anymore because every time I go in there, he's hitting the bottle or, he, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the problem is uh, there is really not such a thing as a functioning alcoholic. It's some part... Yeah. They, I, I know what you're talking about, but at some point, uh, something's going to happen. And when that happens, uh, it's not pleasant for anybody. And so that's, that's the big issue. Uh, uh, you don't work in that in a department. Uh, try to let somebody know. Uh, send a note, a confidential note. Um, these are all, and, and you know, at the same time, if that person, uh, and the truth is that that person doesn't want to stop drunk, drinking, doesn't want to stop taking drugs, doesn't want to try to get medication, there's not a whole lot you can do if they are to that point that they refuse any type of intervention. Uh, and you can be concerned, uh, you can ask other people about it, but it's a difficult situation. It's probably not as helpful as I could be, but that's the truth of the matter. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to cover, but at the same time, it's uh, uh, you have your program, and uh, I have my lunch, my dinner I need to eat. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>